Very good. So it's a great pleasure to introduce my favorite economist, <laughs> uh, Joe Stieglitz. Actually, I met him uh, in the 80s, 1980s. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, but he didn't meet me, so uh, I was just in the audience. Uh, but since then, so he has been really a favorite. And for very good reasons, uh, I would say, that uh, he changed economics, I th would say, really to the better. Uh, he, sort of have a, I, he was in the forerunner in the informational revolution in economics that changed the, the view many economists have on markets, enforcing contracts, power, institutions economic development, all these things, uh, Joe had a tremendous impact on, uh, and uh, he was a, extremely, and still is, an extremely productive researcher. So the, uh, mon many pe people say that, can you point at one uh, influential article or two? I can point at 200, and, and sometimes you have a feeling that you can point at 200 per year, but <laughs> maybe that's an exaggeration. So, but he, he has gone on, uh, as you also know that he has been uh, uh, a public intellectual and also one who served uh, in, in important institutions as the chief economist of the World Bank and uh, also as the chief of the Council of Economic Advisor uh, in the US. He received the Nobel Prize in Economics, uh, of course, I would say, uh, in 2001. Uh, and he also become a public intellectual in, in, this, in really the good sense of the word, that uh, are, are free to speak out on important issues, uh, are very clear. So the productivity of writing articles has also gone over to writing books, one after one, some <laughs> carefully edited and some carefully written by himself. So I, 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 th I think it's extremely impressive. He has a, a, a cold mind but a very warm ho heart. And, and uh, as you know, most economists have got these things the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, the, uh, what I thought I'd do, uh, the t official title of my talk was Secrecy, Transparency, and Globalization. I'm going to spend uh, about two-thirds of the time talking about secrecy and transparency about information, which uh, Kali s pointed out was w was subject of, of much of my r research. Um, the uh, I want to spend a, a, a few moments reflecting uh, on my original interest um, in information, which was in the uh, area of economics. The uh, models that economists uh, had used for more than 200 years, beginning with Adam Smith, or even before that, uh, assumed perfect information. Now, it wasn't that economists were so stupid that they believed that there was perfect information, but uh, they believed that if you, m a world in which information was not too imperfect could be well modeled by, a mo uh, by constructing a theory with perfect information, and they didn't know how to construct a theory with imperfect information. So, in, in a way, part of my contribution was to develop mathematical techniques for analyzing in a precise way uh, the consequences of imperfect information. And one of the major insights was that that hope that people had had that a world in which information was pretty good could be well described by a model with perfect information. That was wrong. Even a little bit of information imperfections dramatically changed all the results. So, um, as I put it uh, uh, somewhat uh, in, a, uh, in a quip, uh, you know, the, the most famous th theorem, uh, the, the result in economics is Adam Smith's uh, idea of the invisible hand, that the pursuit of self-interest would lead, as if by an invisible hand, to the well-being of society. Uh, what I argue was uh, the reason that the invisible hand was invisible was it wasn't there. And uh, that, uh, generically, in general, markets were not efficient. Well, uh, the, uh, 
words that we used uh, in economics of perfect information, imperfect information, got translated when you moved into the political sphere in terms of words like transparency and, and secrecy. So, in a way, the, the, the concepts of transparency and, tr and secrecy were really exactly the same kinds of concepts that I had been, uh, uh, I spent much of my uh, work in economics trying to uh, understand. And just like uh, economies don't work very well when there's imperfect information, uh, so too uh, for politics. Um, and a lot of the, the work in economics is about how do we, uh, how, how, how do we create legal frameworks to help enhance uh, information perfections, reduce information asymmetries. And on the other hand, how the private sector works very hard going the other way <laughs> uh, to increase information asymmetries, lack of transparency, um, I'll come back and make some references to our banks who really excel in secrecy. Their whole business model is based on uh, secrecy and lack of transparency. Uh, the same thing is actually true in, in politics. That uh, there is a, um, uh, a battle, you might say, between, uh, on the one hand, uh, trying to get more transparency, more openness. Uh, on, and that's what the press is involved in and uh, 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 a lot of ac economic, a lot of activity around uh, trying to enhance transparency. We have uh, legal frameworks to try to uh, encourage that. But on the other hand, uh, there are efforts uh, equally strong to uh, uh, discourage, uh, to, to hide things, a lack of transparency. Well, early on, uh, I thought uh, that having better laws about transparency wa would suffice to address the issue. So 15, 20 years ago, I was actively involved in efforts to uh, pass right to no laws, right? Freedom of Information Acts. You know, I in Scandinavia, you take those laws uh, for granted because you've had them for over 200 years. But uh, in the rest of the world, uh, that was a new idea. And uh, it met with uh, originally a lot of resistance, but eventually it, it, it became a global movement. Uh, and not only at national levels, but subnational levels of passing uh, right to no laws. And, and the basic idea was a, a really very simple one, that if the government is supposed to be reflecting uh, of the citizens, that you own the government in some sense, it's accountable to you, you should know what the government is doing. Um, I mean, it seems almost obvious that, you know, if somebody's working for you, you should know something about uh, what he's doing uh, or she's doing. Uh, and uh, yet many uh, countries do not have and still do not have good uh, right to know laws. And uh, there's a lot of resistance to um, uh, right to know laws. The, um, so... So or originally I thought, you know, the real battle was to enhance, to, to induce governments to be m more transparent. Uh, just as an aside, uh, in the area of, uh, of uh, uh, natural resources, uh, even in the United States, uh, we do not have access to the contracts that our government signs with the mining, comp oil, mining and oil companies. So even today, they call those uh, commercial secrets. And so you think in a vast country, you would have transparency of that kind. And uh, this is an example of that kind of battle that, w that we are constantly facing. So we understand the principle of right to know laws. And we also understand that a lot of, for obvious reasons, the, the mining companies, oil companies, don't want that because they don't want to uh, uh, the citizens to know how they're ripping off the ordinary, the rest of our country. 
So uh, we, we even understand the incentives on part of both sides. And uh, it is n most citizens are not aware of the extent of, uh, of, of the exploitation that occurs. And it is exploitation when a mining company is taking away the value of a resource of a country for its own private purposes. Um, the extent of that is not well known. Well, uh, I had hoped, as I said, that uh, just pushing for right to know laws, transparency laws, would suffice. And I have to say, having watched that uh, battle, uh, I'm no longer convinced uh, that that is uh, sufficient. To put it, let me go, just go back a second to, to, to put uh, a, a frame on, on why I've become a little uh, disillusioned on that, is um, in economic analysis, uh, the standard is that companies are required to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, but not the whole truth. <laughs> uh, so you're not supposed to lie, but you're not supposed to say, you know, what we're selling isn't really good for you. You're, you're, you're supposed to, um, uh, you don't have to tell everything. And um, misleading, telling a lie is called fraud. And, or, you know, wrong, uh, misleading informa uh, advertising. And we have laws against fraud. Uh, we have laws against uh, misleading ad 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 advertising. What we've discovered is it's extraordinarily difficult to enforce those laws. Um, the banks in the United States, uh, the mortgage originating companies, committed massive fraud in 2007, 2008, 2006, and then run up to the crisis. And the legal cases prosecuting the banks are still going on a decade, more than a decade after the crisis. The banks are saying, well, you caught us, we paid $29 billion of penalties, but you have to prove every case. <laughs> so yes, here's another set of cases, another several billion dollars, you to you have to go improve it. And what they're hoping is that they'll find some judge who is pro-bank and say, well, you know, that's just business. Uh, as you, you know, everybody does it. So that's sort of the standard. Everybody commits fraud. And therefore, uh, you know, th there are actually two defenses. Everybody does it. And we did it so blatantly. 80% uh, of, of, of our loans were fraudulent you should have known that they were fraudulent, so how can you blame us? Now, that is the defense, uh, literally, that the banks, like Bank America is using today to defend itself against fraud, is that we were so fraudulent that if you didn't know it, you were derelict. <laughs> well, what that helps uh, highlight is that uh, the prosecution of fraud is difficult. And just having transparency, knowing that there's fraud, isn't, uh, hasn't proven to be a solution. In the area of politics, things are, all, uh, are even more difficult. In the United States, the, the problem of what I'll call misinformation, you know, telling a lie, um, was brought home in, in the election um, of uh, 2004, uh, when uh, President Bush accused uh, John Kerry of what was called the Swift Boat uh, incident, where uh, you know it, you, you might say you know it, it, it was to use an American word chutzpah that that uh, uh, Bush had been a, tra a draft evader and Kerry had fought in the Vietnam War. And the fake news in the swift boat was that Kerry was a coward <laughs> and had left his boat behind or something like that. And that story circulated and it was called the Swi swift boat incident and undermined the credibility of, of Kerry. And many people th 
thought affected the election. Now, that incident was a one-off incident. It was a terrible incident. It affected the uh, outcome of the election. Um, it showed, you might say, the malevolence of the Republican Party. But uh, it, people sort of put it in a category of things that have happened of that kind. But with Trump, that's changed enormously because what Trump has done has changed our whole mindset because it, he, what he's gone back to is Goebbels' big lie that if I lie enough, nobody will know whether I'm lying. Uh, they don't know what the truth is. And in a way, we've had, again, in the commercial side and the economic side, we've had incidents of that, isolated, but still we've, we're aware that that has occurred. Um, when the evidence was absolutely overwhelming that smoking caused cancer and other diseases, the cigarette companies organized a, a concerted campaign of uh, skepticism. They didn't quite say it wasn't true. They said there was scientific doubt. And what they knew very cleverly was that people who were addicted to smoking and they had put addictive, they had made the cigarettes more addictive, they had actually designed them to be addictive, would, would not want to hear, would not want to hear the story that uh, cigarettes were bad for your health. So the, the n idea that it was, there was scientific doubt was exactly what they wanted to know and people continued to smoke. And by the way, at that point, the cigarette companies had in their own records ample evidence. They knew that they were killing people, but they put profits over lives. And that was a very successful campaign for 20, 30 years until the evidence just mounted uh, over overwhelmingly. So if you can sell people on bad, uh, uh, bad products that actually kill you, like cigarettes, you can sell bad ideas. And that's what Trump and, and the Republican Party have been engaged in uh, uh, f for the last several years and using, you know, all the tools that, that have, that marketing people have developed, but made far worse by modern technology because what they were able to do with modern technology is to target information to people depending on their receptivity of information. They could give a different message to every audience and therefore have a much more receptive, uh, you, you, you could shape what you said to each audience to make it more likely uh, that it would be positively received. So how, do, how, how does this change you know, my own thinking or, or our general understanding of uh, the economics and the politics of information. Well, the, the basic model that had influence, uh, that where I began my work was one of a rational individual with imperfect information. But when you presented them with the information, they rationally processed that information and came up with inferences. Those of you who know about statistics, you might say everybody was a Bayesian. So they had their priors, they took new information, they revised their priors to come up with rational posteriors. But that's not the way humans are. And I, 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 non-humans are also probably that, not that way either, but, but uh, I'm talking here about uh, humans. So that's not the way humans are. Uh, we have strong cognitive uh, limitations and a lot of the, the most important research in economics over uh, the last uh, 40 years has been what we call behavioral economics, which is understanding how we actually do behave, how we process information, and how we process information is very different from 
the way the standard economic models pre had, had set. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, as, a, as a side point, when I actually began my research, I felt very strongly that way. But I knew I would not be able at that point to convince my colleagues uh, of that, that I had to begin, and, and this is a, in a sense a crude insight I had about you know, how academic disciplines uh, work, that it, that was too big of a leap to ask the economics profession to go. So you first had to convince them that even with a rational mind, with imperfect information, everything they knew was wrong. <laughs> Then after they co got convinced of that, then they could get convinced that, in fact, the way they process information was also limited. Uh, we, we had to convince humans that they were human. Uh, and, and I think we've succeeded in, in, in doing that now. Well, let me now, uh, with sort of, uh, the, the problem is that what I've just done is describe the problem that we have, that people have cognitive limitations, the way we process information is, is uh, limited uh, by a whole set of, of uh, uh, constraints that can make it possible for us to be exploited. There are people who very carefully, and people in marketing, and who've carefully studied how we respond and how to motivate us. And uh, that makes us more open to exploitation unless we become more aware of the way that people succeed in exploiting our cognitive limitations. Well, the third topic uh, that I was supposed to uh, uh, comment on was globalization. And uh, there are a couple of important uh, points I, I want to, uh, the, the issues I've just been talking about uh, of secrecy and transparency, I got very involved in when I was uh, chief economist of the World Bank for the obvious reason that while the World Bank uh, was involved in giving assistance to developing countries and we were trying to get others to give assistance to developing countries, the flow of money out of developing countries was uh, actually outweighing the flow of money in. The flow of corrupt money uh, out of uh, the countries, particularly natural resource countries, uh, but not just natural resource countries. Um, uh, the flow out uh, through corruption of one form or another, unfair contracts, uh, mining contracts, oil contra contracts, uh, and that uh, if we could combat those illicit or some of them legal but, but should have been illegal uh, uh, contracts, it would make a great deal of difference to the well-being of these countries. The, um, uh, as I say, the magnitudes of, uh, of these flows out uh, were uh, really large. Um, some of uh, what we were fighting for was designing better contracts, uh, better, more, uh, uh, better enforced, uh, to understand what the contracts were. Many of the contracts, as I say, even in the United States, are not transparent. Uh, they use arguments of, of uh, commercial uh, secrecy. But um, all these problems became much worse in many ways with uh, advances in globalization uh, because uh, that enabled money to flow out from developing countries to develop countries into uh, more easily into secrecy havens. And uh, uh, the Panama Papers uh, is an uh, illustration uh, and the Paradise Papers that brought out the magnitude of what was going on. And I think before the Panama uh, Papers and the Paradise Papers, you know, people understood that there was a lot of money, but they didn't understand how how much and how pervasive it was in our societies, how it reached to the leaders 
in many of the uh, 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 to the leaders of many of the countries. Um, the um, uh, before the Panama Paradise Papers uh, came out, uh, I um, had an occasion to uh, give a talk at a bank in one of the uh, secrecy havens. And uh, I don't know why they invite me to give these lectures because I, I uh, always, I'm a little bit of a moralist uh, and I, I, I chastise them for their bad behavior and, uh, you know, uh, on how much damage they're doing to uh, other countries. And uh, there's just one, one occasion at the end of the, of, the, of the talk, a couple of the bankers came up to me and said, you don't understand really our business model. We don't do drugs. Uh, we don't do money laundering. Uh, we just do tax evasion. And, <laughs> and uh, I, I asked them, uh, well, how do you know? And he says, because we asked them. <laughs> So anyway, that gives you a flavor of, of what goes on. They actually, you know, relative to their neighbors, they, they, they felt, we're really moral people. We, we, we just confine our immorality to a limited domain. Um, Gabriel Zuckman has estimated that the magnitudes of global wealth that are in these secrecy havens, are, it's about 8% of global G, uh, wealth. So we're not talking about a little money. It's a very significant uh, uh, amount of money. Um, on the Panama Papers, um, uh, and you're talking about shame, and uh, as in the previous uh, session, uh, the Panama Papers uh, did have an effect in uh, shaming uh, Panama uh, <laughs> for a minute. Uh, and uh, so they, they uh, called me and a few other people up and they wanted to have a commission to uh, figure out how to be a, a responsible global citizen. And um, uh, I always, uh, in re retrospect, say, you know, we, we uh, uh, both didn't do our job uh, in Googling well enough. Uh, I didn't Google the Panamanian government uh, as well as I should because I, uh, the person who came down and talked to me was the vice president and flew into uh, Colombia and, and uh, she had worked at the UNDP and, and you know, was, uh, uh, seemed really concerned about restoring Panama's uh, uh, reputation um, and was very convincing. Uh, but uh, what I hadn't realized was that the uh, Monseca, which uh, was the law firm that uh, was associated with where the uh, Paradise Papers, was a very good friend of the president. Of uh, So um, if I had known that, I would have said, what was the probability that the, the government was serious about changing as opposed to serious about changing its image? Um, and on the other hand, they hadn't Googled me either so they didn't realize that uh, I was not, you know, likely to to uh, agree to uh, just a, a facade. So uh, one of the first th the things that we did after, uh, and one of the other people that was appointed to uh, this commission was Mark Pyth, uh who is a uh, Basel-based, uh, very, uh, very strong a lawyer ba uh, who does a lot of work in corruption. Um, so, uh, one of the first things that we, the two of us did when we uh, formed the commission was said, uh, we have to have transparency in our report on transparency. You know, we said, that's, we thought obvious that when we issue a report, it had to be public. And uh, the Panamanian government, we didn't hear from them, we didn't hear from them, and finally they said, no, no, we can't, we can't be transparent about transparency. <laughs> and... <laughs> And so uh, we had uh, to resign uh, from this commission, and uh, it, it shows you a, a little bit. Uh, they got more bad publicity. Our appointment got a little bit of publicity, but our res resignation got more publicity than our appointment. So in the end, uh, uh, Panama uh, 
did did uh, suffered from their their um, uh, uh, dis disingenuousness. Well, after that, uh, uh, Mark Python and I wrote actually went ahead and had our own commission <laughs> where we wrote up what we thought of would be a uh, a good agenda for transparency for uh, for these countries and. Uh, you know what kind of information uh, had to be uh, disclosed, um, and one of the things, uh, and I'm not going to go through the whole whole thing, but one of the things that became uh, very clear, and something that had become clear um, uh, even before, is that um, it's not just the money laundering that goes in our banks. Uh, it's uh, the real estate sector, which is really central to uh, money laundering. Um, and of course, in the United States, we knew that. Uh, but if we didn't know that, Donald Trump has made it very clear uh, that he's made his money by uh, money laundering, uh, uh, of Ru particularly Russian uh, uh, um, dirty money. The Final, let me, uh, time is running out, L let me just make uh, uh, two uh, broad comments. Um, while we focus a lot on the developing countries and what they've done wrong, uh, there are two participants in all the corruption that occurs, and that is uh, the other side of it is developed countries. When money was stolen from Nigeria, it went to London. It's not just the offshore, it's the onshore. Uh, dirty Russian money w winds up in New York City. And so it's what we can do in developed countries that can play uh, as, as or more important role. Um, when I was uh, the, uh, uh, represented the United States at the OECD meetings, uh, one of the issues that uh, uh, was on the agenda was uh, m bribery. A, a, a thing, this was 20 years ago, and, uh, when uh, several countries made bribes tax deductible. And the argument was it were business expense. <laughs> Uh, and, the argu uh, you know, and, and the argument I made is, yes, they are <laughs> cost of business, but do you want to encourage that form of business? And I view one of our successes in that particular meeting was to get the few remaining advanced countries that uh, allowed for tax deductibility of bribery to say, no, it wasn't. It wasn't going so far as to say, we'll discourage bribes. Uh, but at least not to encourage them through tax deductibility. And then that led the United States, we had the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and trying to make those acts global. Uh, um, Britain, other countries uh, have, d have done that. Um, the example of what happened with Dodd-Frank where they had country by country reporting and enormous pushback from industry and tied it up in the courts and finally uh, the court rejected it, and, and, and I'm not sure where it is right now. The point I, I want to emphasize is I think the advanced countries have a, a very important role. I think ex uh, 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 civil society has a very important role uh, in explaining how bad this is for our whole global society. And um, there are obviously people making profits out of, you know, the rank seekers are it's totally understandable why this is a political battle. But this is a political battle that I think we can win. And that's where I, I do think the journalists play an important role. I think most citizens in our country do not want to see this kind of uh, pillage of poor countries by rich corporations uh, and would like to see uh, you know, this is, uh, in terms of, of the usual battle of good and evil, this, you can't get a, a, a starker picture than this. And that's why I think in the long run, continuing to have strong reporting on this is a battle that we will win. Thank you.
Sorry. Thank you very much for for this talk. I uh, I do everything that people ask me to do. So I'm supposed to give some comments on what I've heard, and then we're going to have a conversation. I'm not quite sure how we are doing on time, but that's not my responsibility because uh, I think they gave me more time than uh, they had thought. But I think that was because the talk was so interesting. So uh, I have four comments uh, based on what he he said. Uh, and uh, uh, one of them is on tax haven, another one is on behavioral economics, a third one is on laws, and I can't remember what the fourth was, but I uh, guess I'm going to remember when I start uh, talking about So the first thing is about it, it, it globalization and tax havens. I think if very often we underappreciate and are too little critical of the criminal activities that these tax havens actually uh, induce and uh, uh, very often we talk about organized crime but but we don't uh, quite understand what it means organized crime all crime is more or less organized but what is meant by organized crime is enforcement of contracts among criminals they can't go to the court system they can't go to the court system you you owe me for this uh, last uh, smuggling mm. of of uh, opium you owe me uh, three million you can't go to a court with, uh, among criminals, but you can go to a tax haven. You can coordinate things in a way. Why? Because it's secret. And that's the reason why they play a coordinating role, enforcing contracts, making a s system in the underworld. And, and they, they, they wouldn't be able to do that if that was the only thing they did. The reason why they, they admit that they do, we only do tax evasion, but, but since they do tax evasion, they have this secrecy of, of the system that I think is important. So we'd, when we continue the conversation, we'd like to hear uh, Joe's uh, uh, opinion about these things. Because I think things are very... Uh, I studied a little bit the uh, opium trade uh, in Afghanistan and, and, uh, and similar drug trade in Colombia and so on. I think these tax havens are extremely important to, uh, for that. So that was uh, the first... Um, uh, thing. The other thing, and maybe that was the one I forgot about uh, to mention in the introduction, that is fake news or fake information. I think one element of that that is n not observed enough that we would like to hear your opinion about, that is the fake presentation of sort of, say, the, ho the, the uh, home pages of big companies. Take Equinu, the one of the most successful companies in, in Norway. A uh, company that uh, Joe knows mm. very well. Uh, you read the home pages and you compare what they are doing. These two things don't correspond at all. <laughs> <laughs> but they may have a common element, but there are huge masses uh, of things that are that are not uh, uh, that not really cohere. And and the reason is that sort of Equino is involved in a lot of undemocratic regimes where they help a corrupt elite to plunder the nation to take out to extract the uh, resources in these countries. They say that this is for the benefits of development in these undemocratic regimes, but is it? Have, uh, how can that be in the, in the interest of the people that they have no influence over the government? The government is stealing the money in most of the cases, place it in tax havens, uh, and then to claim that this is pro-development, it's pro equinour even though they don't make that much money of it, but it is really bad for, for the behavior, uh, for, for, for how these countries behave, because you have these plundering activities by companies that write about themselves, just as if they are really angels on the planet. They are not, they are plundering, and those who, those who, so those who steal directly are, of course, the elite in the country. But those, those who are helping in the stealing are also guilty. And I think this, this, we have to sort of be much more talking about social responsibility. This is the first thing, to be honest, to follow the laws and regulations. That's the first thing in corporate responsibility. The other things <coughs> most likely are cosmetics. And, and we, are, we are focusing too much on the cosmetics, too little on, on the real issues. The, the, the third thing is that when we are talking about uh, laws and regulation in these important areas, 
I think, it, uh, and I would like to hear Joe's opinion about this, I think social organization is extremely important. I, I think you, you mentioned this um, deductible of, of bribe money. That there was a social movement in Norway, not a very big one. There were ideas for a new uh, global economy uh, that was very active in, in, uh, in trying to, to get this to in, in, in a Norwegian context. And, um, and uh, I think th this was very important. And there were similar organizations in every country. So, so I think that helped in, the, in when OECD finally accepted this principle. I, I think that these social movements were very important. And sometimes these social movements, they are substitute for laws, and sometimes they are complements to laws, in the sense that they help enforcing the laws, in particular when you have fake news and, and uh, asymmetric information in the deep sense. Uh, so my final remark is about behavioral economics that I think is, is important for a lot of things, uh, politics, uh, globalization, development in general. But I will emphasize one thing that uh, Joe didn't mention, of course it, it was a short talk, and that is that many people have motivated beliefs, that they sort of invest in beliefs about the world. And they have sort of start to believe, it's very, it's very, it's very difficult if you are a crook, and I think there are a lot of crooks uh, all over there. It's very difficult to think about yourself as a crook. So then you invest in the belief that what you are doing is actually very good. And, uh, and in the end, you start believing in this. Uh, so this is the role of critical, both media, investigative journalism, or, and economics, I, I, and other disciplines, uh, but economics, uh, Joe knows everything about. Uh, but I think these are things are very important. That this investment in motivated beliefs, I mean, if you have invested in that, it's very difficult to change your mind. Because m most people have this, uh, this uh, uh, a fallacy that they think that, uh, that uh, previous investment uh, have to sort of, you have to follow them, otherwise it, w it wasn't uh, any sense of doing all this work that you have. And people believe in it after a while. And this is why critical journalism, critical economics, critical social sciences and social organizations are very important because people have to be shaken a little bit in our beliefs. So these are the four points that we'll hear and we can maybe talk uh, and engage. The you are here for another 10 hours, I guess. So, um <laughs> But I will hear in the beginning some... Uh, okay, let, let me just make a, c a, a few comments on each of the things that you raised. Um, let me uh, maybe b begin with the second point, which is the <coughs> role uh, in, and, and it's not just uh, Equinor, but it's, it's natural resource companies, World Bank. I agree. Uh, in, uh, it's nice to be self-critical since yeah, we are yeah, here. Uh, uh, in working with uh, dictatorships to ex uh, extract natural resources. Uh, where that came up very strongly uh, in the World Bank uh, 20 years ago was the Chad Cameroon pipeline. And uh, Chad was one of the worst governments. And uh, the World Bank tried to make itself feel good about it because they said they got Chad to agree that all the money would go to a trust fund to help the education of poor people in Chad. Well, you can, pr you know where the story is going to go. Uh, ten years later, Chad government says, well, uh, that trust fund was just really a facade. We'll take the money and use it for our own military. And um, the the fundamental thing about natural resources is that they're going to be there. They're not going to go away. So if you don't take them out now, they'll be there to be taken out later. If you take them out now, when there is an authoritarian government, the money is going to be squandered. And rather than being used for the people who really own the, uh, uh, the resource, uh, they'll go to the benefit of, the, of, of the, uh, that. So I always think that it's better just to leave them in the natural mm -hmm. I I underground as an asset that the country has, typically going up in value rather than extract it. Um, and when countries say, you know, w we need it to grow now, 
I, I say, you know, get, get your... Go- if it, we know that if you have a corrupt government, you're not going to be able to grow anyway mm-hmm. with a very high probability. So uh, um, at least that, that, that's my uh, view on that. Now, um, Kelly is absolutely right about the, the uh, pivotal role, the importance of these uh, secrecy havens. And I just want to emphasize one aspect of that, which is the real estate havens, uh, like in the United States, mm-hmm. and, uh, and how easy it would be to address it, that it really is a political problem in the advanced countries. So at the very end of Obama's administration, uh, he finally did something about it. Why he didn't do it earlier is something that's still a mystery. And one of the things he did, and it was limited to a few American cities, including New York, he said that if you buy an apartment in New York, a house, that costs more than a million dollars, you have to disclose the beneficial owner. There had been, and this is actually, it, it was partly, I think, motivated by some good reporting in the New York Times where a couple of the towers, uh, they exposed who were owning the big uh, apartments. A little bit embarrassing with some of our students uh, w- were among the owners uh, from, an, not American <laughs> students, but from uh, uh, developing uh, countries, poor developing countries, uh, that managed to buy multi-million dollar apartments. Uh, so we got a little glimpse of what uh, uh, was going on. Um, and uh, uh, it was done just to a few cities. And the interesting thing was when they, pa- when they enacted the leg- uh, this rule, didn't even require new legislation. It was just an administrative rule that the Treasury could have issued any time it wanted. Could have done this years and years ago. The prices in New York real estate fell. Mm-hmm. And what that told you was that the dirty money was an important part of the New York real estate industry, which of course we all knew, <laughs> but we got a quantitative metric of how important uh, how important it was. Um, the um, final point you made uh, about motivated beliefs again, I think I think is a, uh, uh, a a really important one. And in the language of behavioral economics, uh, we refer to this as confirmatory bias. That when you have a set of beliefs, information that's consistent with your prior beliefs is. Uh, uh, recognized information which is inconsistent with those prior beliefs is discounted and so that makes it really difficult to change to get a a national uh, uh, understanding and here's where the danger of the new social media and in particular the dangers of you know what's happened in in the United States with Fox News, is there's been a polarization that uh, people who watch Fox News, it used to be people read a whole set of media which would have all kinds of coverage. Now people read a media that is consistent with their prior beliefs. Mm -hmm. So people who read Fox News live in a world that is very disconnected from those who read the New York Times or the Washington Post or any of the mainstream uh, news media. So getting them to to form a national consensus about what's going on, what's a lie even, what's Mm -hmm. fake news, has been increasingly, increasingly difficult. I think... uh some of these uh, motivated beliefs, y- I think you're right, sometimes they polarize people in to the extremes. And sometimes they make conflicts between uh, organizations that are very close to each other. Because if we have sort of invested a lot in our own beliefs, uh, beliefs 
Uh, but we are, uh, you are a Trotskyist and I'm a Stalinist. <laughs> uh, of course, viewed from outside, we are identical. But uh, but but you are a threat to me, and I'm I'm maybe a threat to you. So that these belief systems that are very close to each other, they can be very conflictual, and and you mm. you see that in, in a lot of conflicts in the world that that these motivated beliefs they are among uh, religious groups, political groups that viewed from outside are very similar. Even even the genocide in Rwanda was b between groups. There was a lot of intermarriages. There's sort of income differences across uh, the Tutsi and the Hutus were, were narrowing down prior to 1994. And and uh, and uh, they, they have the same language. They have the same religion. They are they they are different in ways that are sort of I think the. The Belgians made them different. The uh, colonial power issued uh, uh, identity cards that uh, uh, made them different. And they, they picked out the tall ones to be the Tutsi and uh, not so tall ones to be the Hutus. I, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but, but I think the, the, the point is that motivated beliefs can, can create a lot of conflicts, not only polarization, but also the, the, there's a tyranny of small differences in a sense that, uh, uh, that I. And, and that, that's why debate, um, publicity, social organization, sort of the investigative journalism they have to be be strong. That's uh, I think that I don't know about any other weapon against strong motivated beliefs. Uh, and people have to dare to be like you, more outspoken and uh, and sort of maybe controversial uh, on behalf of their own discipline. I think that helps. I don't know whether you have views yeah. on that. Uh, no, I, th I think there... Uh, this theory uh, your small differences. We uh, well, y you know, uh, economists always uh, talk about differentiated products. <laughs> and in, in the marketplace, <laughs> you, you always try to differentiate uh, how you are different from the other. And, and, and it's a little bit the same thing. Yeah, and partly, one way of, of thinking about it is that... Uh, there are always uh, we call ranks associated with your particular see, position, yeah. and yeah. so if uh, we were perfect, sub it, yeah. and, and it highlights how bad the competitive model is. Mm -hmm. That if I, you know, if we were exactly the same, we would have to share a leadership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if I can say I'm a little bit different and you're not, uh, I could get become the leader. Mm -hmm. So it becomes, you know, we 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 can. The, the issues of individual uh, position and leadership and slight differences in organization mm. get mixed together yeah, and see. exacerbate, I'm, I'm afraid, uh, yeah. principal differences. So I'm, I'm not the boss, actually. I would love to be, but uh, I'm not. So I don't know whether you should uh, end here by a brief comment by each of us, or do you engage the audience, or they're going to be a, a dance, or I don't know. <laughs> um, well, I, <coughs> I can see that we have five minutes more, <laughs> okay. which means that if you'd like to, we can include the audience, take two or three questions, and then, and then the final one round one response for you. Each. That yeah. I think that's a good idea. Well... Who would like to ask questions? I see one hand. We will have three questions, two, and the third one. Okay. So we'll have three questions. Uh, thank you for an interesting talk. My name is Ingrid. I come from the Tax Justice Network Norway. My question concerns the role of capital controls in terms of these illicit flows. I mean, we are an NGO like publish what you pay. We work on transparency measures, trying to get at these illicit flows and tax havens. And the debate we, we don't engage with, but often find ourselves with, is that all these transparency measures don't work as long as you don't have any controls for capital. So globalization brings with it free flows of capital, and that means free flows of illicit, illicit flows as well. Or, or, and then we also get confronted with the argument that no, if you try to regulate capital flows like you did during the Bretton Woods, this is what created the offshore world in the first place. So I would like your comment with the debate of, uh, around capital flows, that, uh, capital controls that have emerged since the financial crisis. As is the ca do they have a function to play in trying to control these illicit flows and get at the secrecy havens? Or are, will trans the transparency measures that we are trying to push, are they sufficient? 
Yeah. Sure. Hi, thank you for a brilliant performance. Um, my name is Sishita Barra. Uh, I'm a research scientist in medicine and artificial intelligence. Uh, I know that you haven't talked and touched upon artificial intelligence today, but I have followed your work and also your statements on that. Um, I think that the development of artificial intelligence is very closely linked to transparency. So I would like to know what kind of measures and um, proposals you have on that, on developing unbiased artificial intelligence. And then the third question. Hi, I'm Paul and I'm a s student. Um, there's been a, a lot of cases where uh, foreign investments in extraction companies has been done through export credits. And um, we have a Freedom of Information Act in here and in Scandinavia, but uh, individual cases on export credits are exempt from that act. So I was wondering if you could talk about like um, what role uh, export credits play in fostering exploitation of natural resources in foreign, uh, foreign countries. Thank you. Okay. Um, so they were all good questions. Let, let me uh, maybe begin with the, the capital controls. Um, uh, I've always thought that capital controls, uh, particularly for developing countries, were important. And it was one of the um, uh, major controversies uh, that I had with the uh, IMF uh, when I was uh, chief economist of, uh, of uh, the World Bank. Uh, our common friend, uh, Kashik Basu, who, who uh, became the chief economist uh, of the World Bank uh, after me, uh, one said that my major contribution uh, at the World Bank was reforming the IMF. <laughs> and and uh, the particular thing, uh, one of the particular things is, uh, the IMF is actually, after uh, in 2010-11, uh, came around to agree with me that y capital controls were important, uh, that uh, instabilities of financial flows were very bad for macroeconomic stability, um, and so I think the, the, the analytic framework, the po general policy consensus is that actually well-regulated capital flows are an important part of economic stability. Uh, what are the best instruments? Are a question that are still debated and the extent of capital controls I I uh, are still debated. Uh, um, uh, I think you know both price and quantity controls are, are an important uh, part of it. But even if you don't have controls, you can have uh, public records. You know those two are separate issues. You you can say in order to take money out of the country, you are allowed to take money out of the country, but you have to register it. When money goes from a bank outside. Um, that that can be noted, and you can have a law that says that any transfer has to go through a bank, and that movements of cash are are illegal, or, or movements of fiscal goods that are not registered, value over a thousand dollars, are illegal, and it seems to me that <laughs> um, uh, if we want to control illicit flows, including tax evasion, we have to have uh, those kinds of laws. And uh, we obviously have the ability to monitor. And this goes back to the point, this is about politics. We have the ability to monitor. We, after 9-11, when, when people got very concerned about the flow of terrorism money, we set up a framework where we know exactly, not not 100, 100 percent, but we know pretty 100, you know, pretty closely all the flows of illicit money that's associated with terrorism. We could do the same for all these other illicit flows if we wanted to, but uh, we could shut down 
the tax havens. The, you know, the tax havens are a creation. We've created them. Uh, uh, and they're really a peculiar cre creation. You know, you, uh, you know, I jokingly say, you know, uh, is there any attribute of the Cayman Islands that makes it a great banking center? Mm -hmm. uh, does money uh, grow better in the sunshine of the Cayman Islands? Mm -hmm. And uh, n no, it's, it's, it's not about the sunshine that makes it a uh, tax haven. Um, what, what, what makes it a tax haven is that we have decided not to enforce certain laws there. And if we said every American and European bank that deals with any other bank can only deal with a bank that subscribes to exactly the same regulatory and transparency standards, uh, it would end. Um, so, um, it, you know, it's, 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 it's a, our creation. Um, in New York, uh, young bankers, you know, when they get recruited, one of the first things, you know, you, you go in and you get your health insurance and your life insurance, you get a, an account in the Cayman Islands or one of the other uh, 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 secrecy havens. It's just part of, of uh, standard practice. So you get into the notion of tax avoidance. Uh, and we ought to stop that. Uh, and we can stop it very easily if there's a political will and if people really understood uh, what, was go what was going on. Um, the uh, artificial intelligence uh, has many, many uh, dimensions to what one, uh, one of the aspects of it is like, so complicated that most of us don't know what's going on in the programs and a lot of reverse engineering. Just one, one thing that um, related to this uh, conference that I, I will mention is uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion of cryptocurrencies. And um, my view is uh, very clearly, you know, we have a very good currency, uh, the dollar, and you have a good currency. The question is, uh, why do you need another currency, Bitcoin, or one of the other. <coughs> but there's only one reason why people want that. It's the word crypto. Mm -hmm. And why do they want to be secretive? Well, uh, I think the major reason they're secretive is tax avoidance and other illicit activities. So I think that uh, we should make cryptocurrencies illegal. And I don't think our society would be an iota worse off. I think they'd be better off. And uh, again, it would be very easy because at one point or another, all cryptocurrencies get converted into ordinary currencies. And if at that point of conversion, you had a registration requirement, you would be able to destroy the uh, benefits of the cryptocurrencies. And once you destroy the crypto part of the cryptocurrency, they would no longer be used. So uh, to me, uh, uh, that's an example of a, of a negative innovation that has really uh, uh, gone the wrong way. Um, on the broad issue of, of uh, export credits, um, I, you know, I, I don't know w what the reason for the law here is, but it, it seems to me that that's an example of unjustified lack of transparency. That, you know, these commercial secrets where uh, uh, if the government is giving an export credit or a bank is giving an export credit for a natural resource, it should be public. And, you know, especially if it's a government export credit, why, why should that be, be secret? There's a more general principle. Uh, I'm not convinced why you should need, for natural resources, export credits at all. These are not infant industries for the most part. These are not things where you're going to say, oh, we're going to learn something by going into this. It's not like 
going into a new field, the value of the resources should be able to be sufficiently great to pay for the investment. And if they're not, you, uh, you really ought to ask, uh, are you, you know, are you really, uh, is this a resource worth extracting? So I think there ought to be a, a, a lot of questions about uh, hidden subsidies for natural resource extraction. So before we end this session, we have the pleasure actually to present a new book on the topic with yes, Anja, with Kalle, yeah. and quite, quite a lot of people in the audience contributing to that book. Could I invite the publisher to come to the front, please? Good morning. Um, as most of you know, this conference has, or as Roy has just mentioned, inspired a, an anthology with the same title, Making Transparency Possible, an Interdisciplinary Dialogue. Um, and we're here to officially launch the book today as well. Um, my name is Katja Stieglitz. Uh, my colleague Simon Osa and I are uh, representing the publishing house Kaplan Dam Akademisk. Uh, specifically the Open Access Division, NUASP, which stands for Nordic Open Access Scholarly Publishing. Uh, first of all, we'd uh, like to congratulate Roy and Mona and all of the contributors on the book. Um, now I need to cheat. <laughs> um, many of whom, of course, as you've mentioned, are here today. It's not very often that uh, we get to work on a project with 25 authors from around the world, uh, from here at Oslo Met, but also South Africa, Syria, Guatemala. Um, it's been a real pleasure, and we're very happy that Roy and Mona have chosen to publish Open Access with us. Uh, as an academic publishing house, our books generally are geared to kind of a relatively narrow audience. Um, this is not the case in, in here with this book. Um, the importance of the topics covered in this book uh, make it relevant for anyone who's interested in the world we're living in. And so uh, we're very pleased to have been able to publish the book and it's one that we're very proud of. Um, the book is published open access and in a nutshell that means that um, the book is funded by public money and the, uh, <coughs> uh, the findings in the book should therefore be open to everyone to read. So this book is free, online, digital, and uh, this is the book's landing page where you can see, you can download the book in different formats and also chapter-wise and here's all the uh, participating authors. So um, we'll send out the link on the Facebook page of uh, this conference, and we'll also send out the link with the um, with email to all the participants. Um, and I would encourage, there's a lot of journalists uh, and journalist students in the room. Uh, for the journalism students, I would particularly encourage you to, to visit the page and read it, because the book gives an, an insight into the complexities of uh, whistleblowers and the kind of journalism that is needed to investigate uh, yeah, the uh, opaque nature of modern economics and so forth. So, um, a lot of the authors are here today, um, so we won't say that much about uh, the, the contents of the book, but I would, uh, I would join Katja in uh, congratulating you all and um, I say we're very proud to be working with this book. Uh, before we end, I'd like to uh, invite Roy and Mona to, to come up. We have a, a small gift. <laughs> For Roy, uh, we have our uh, very special author's wine. 
<laughs> it's very tasty. <laughs> Uh, and for Mona, we decided to go with something else. So these are uh, some very tasty macaroons. <laughs> um. uh, I think we would also like to give thanks to uh, many people in the first session here today. Uh, before we share the macarons, I would also <laughs> like to <laughs> say uh, thank you just to um, Joseph and Kalle. For And thank you so much for uh, talking about a very, very important issue of making transparency possible. And I do agree with uh, Kalle that it is important that everybody uses their platform to speak out loud and clear what can be done to make transparency possible and to make that understandable for an audience. This book is one little contribution where we hope to at least inspire um, Perhaps journalism students in particular, and to share a little about what it takes to uncover the mechanisms behind illicit financial flows and to inspire more students to do so. And we could obviously not have done that without Kaplan Dam, and I so appreciate your fantastic work going into the, this process. I really am impressed. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously there are financing behind such a book as well, and it could not have been done uh, without NORAD. Uh, it could not have been done without Norsk Forskningsråd and Finansmarkedsfondet, who's behind financing of the conference. So I would like to give thanks also to the financing uh, donors behind the book, Musul, Katja, and Simon. Thank you. <laughs>